want to start by remembering something that I think must have made um, Jane Addams feel a sense of shame. She had gone over to the front in World War I after she had worked so, so hard. I mean, people came pretty close to stopping the US entry into World War I. And Jane Addams was certainly at the forefront of that, along with all of her many other works. And, and they didn't succeed. But then she took the long sea voyage. She went over to Europe. She sat at the bedsides of young men who'd been mangled and maimed, survivors of the hideous battles in World War I. And again and again, they told her we couldn't have continued the fight without being drugged. And they told her that they had extra doses of rum, they had absinthe, they actually had opium, hampers of opium were being bought by family members to the front because that's the only way they could survive the horror. And so when she came back and there was a huge audience to hear her talk about what she'd seen and heard, she set aside her notes and she told about the horrors that were so awful in what the young men had described to her that she'd met. And she told about how so many of them said the only way they could persist was by being drugged. The press vilified her. They pilloried her. They said, how could you be such a callous woman to make people think that those brave, loyal soldiers, those courageous soldiers, were possibly becoming addicted to drugs? And she tried hard to say, no, 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 that's not my point. But I think you know, she was kind of quieted for some time. And it must have been a source of shame to her that her country had contributed toward causing so much suffering in World War I. And had the United States not entered into that war, history might have gone very, very differently. Well, I'd like to think some more about that idea of gaining the clarity that we need. And, and really, um, Chris and others in the Uptown neighborhood and, and I, we, at some point in the 80s, gained a certain sense of clarity about nuclear weapons and social work and where the monies in this country were going. And we decided that the right thing for us to do was to go out to the missile silo fields of Missouri and plant corn on top of nuclear missile silo sites. And that earned me a one year in maximum security prison. But, um, I, I want to tell you about that particular day in August when we were out for the first time, we did it many times, planting corn on nuclear missile silos in Kansas City's surrounding area. Because I had um, gone by myself to one of the missile silo sites, and um, I was very, very nervous. My heart was pounding. I thought, oh, what if I get impaled on the barbed wire fence, but uh, managed to get onto the other side of this um, barbed wire fence. and. I planted my six pellets of pink corn and um, sat down and calmed down. And pretty soon I saw a vehicle speeding down the country road, and rocks and gravel were flying. And out climbed four men in full military garb, wearing helmets and combat boots and walkie talkies and camouflage. And they um, crouched down, and one of them said, All personnel, please clear the site. Well, I was going to do whatever they said. So pretty soon I was handcuffed and kneeling in a field. And a soldier had his gun, I mean, not on my head, but at my head, and the other three took off, the other three soldiers, maybe to find out what does chapter two of the manual say to do next, because this was kind of <laughs> new for everybody. And I lasted about a minute and a half in, in silence, and I'm kind of preternaturally extroverted, so pretty soon, I didn't look at this soldier, I just started babbling, telling him you know, who I was and a bit about the neighborhood and why we did what we did and that we hoped that this would help children in his life as well as children in the Soviet Union. And then I asked him, do you think the corn will grow? And he said, I don't know, ma'am, but I sure hope so. <laughs> And then I asked him, would you like to say a prayer? Yes, ma'am. So I did a memorized peace prayer from St. Francis. And then he said, amen. And then he asked me, ma'am, would you like a drink of water? Now I'm handcuffed, right? And I said, oh, yes, please. And then he said, ma'am, please tilt your head back. And I did. And I can still feel that water dribbling down my chin. Think of it, that young soldier, in order to pour water from his canteen down ma'am's throat, just might have disarmed himself. 
But I mostly tonight want to ask you to please stay with that question with me. Would you like a drink of water? Ask atop a nuclear weapon buried under the ground. Would you like a drink of water? Imagine with our armed, shameful might, if we could ask the children of Yemen, children succumbing to cholera, children who've been bombed by the Saudis using our weapons, children who are among those who they say could be 20 million people that are going to starve in coming months. Imagine if we could ask a child facing cholera and starvation in Yemen, would you like a drink of pure water? Or let's bring it closer to home. Let's go to Flint, Michigan. Would you like a drink of pure water. And let's bring it to the grandchildren, the little ones you've nurtured and loved, facing a future where water will be a shortage and where the pollution that we continue to be unable to deal with because the military takes all. Imagine being able to say to those little ones, would you like a drink of pure, clean water? But as long as the military, like a demonic suction cup, continues to take all the resources, our capacity to ask the clear thinking questions is as fogged as what happened to the soldiers that Jane Addams met sitting at the bedsides of the maimed and the mangled. I don't watch television, well, at all. And so, this year, in the springtime, when I was watching a television in New York, I was about to give a talk at Manhattan College and then at the Catholic Worker House, and I thought, well, I should really know what President Trump is saying to both houses of Congress. And so I, I watched him on television. And I was so stunned that I honestly couldn't get out of bed the next day. <laughs> I was laid low. So I'm going to ask you to remember that evening with me. Some of you may have seen it. The president was addressing both houses of Congress. It wasn't an official State of the Union address because he hadn't been president all that long. But as happens often when a president is addressing a large group of lawmakers, he had in the gallery somebody whose story he was pretty confident would really evoke a lot of support for what he was saying. And so he had the widow of Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen, who was a Navy SEAL who had been killed. And as she struggled to maintain her composure, and he kind of shouted, you know he's up above, you know he's looking down on you, and he'll never be forgotten. And uh, there was a four-minute standing ovation for the bereaved widow. And certainly, she deserved everybody's sympathy, this woman whose arms will ache for a loved one who will never return. But was so, what was so unusual about that was that at no point, either from a media person or a commentator or from President Trump, was there ever a mention of where Chief Petty Ryan Owen was killed? What country did this happen in? And the country was Yemen. And the town was a little place called al Riyal, And it was a poor town. The Navy SEALs were trying to attack Al-Qaeda fighters. But when they arrived, and neighboring people from a nearby village heard the explosions, they thought there must be a rival tribe that was attacking their neighbors. So they came running. And even though it turned out that it was the United States, they came fighting. And they managed to down the helicopter that the Navy SEALs had arrived in. So the Navy SEALs called for air support. And can you imagine a young woman named Farah she was 30 years old. She was in her home and she was shuddering. And all of a sudden, the US fired projectile missile tore right through her home, her little tiny hut. And so not knowing what to do next, she scooped up her newborn infant. She grabbed her toddler. She went outside the hut into the darkness. And perhaps it was a drone, I don't know. But her image was picked up and a United States helicopter airship gun fired bullets into her head and killed her instantly. She was one of 29 Yemeni people from that village killed that night. 
Ten of them were children under 13 years of age, and six were women. But we only heard about Chief Petty Officer Ryan Owen. And this is the kind of exceptionalism that is so very, very dangerous in our world today. We, a number of us here, um, Buddy Bell, Mary Dean, and I have gone over to Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, where we visit in the city of Kabul, is home to a group called the Afghan Peace Volunteers. And these youngsters do what I think is some of the most important surveillance that could ever be done. There are tethered blimps surveying the city of Kabul. There are drones constantly flying over Kabul. There are 70,000 analysts constantly picking up all the drone footage and trying to see who is going where and establish patterns of life in Afghanistan. But our young friends go up the mountainside. They go to the refugee camps and they survey asking some very crucial questions, one of which is, where do you get your water from? Another, how often in a week are you able to have beans? And another, who earns an income in your family? And how old is that person? And they take that information, often learning that it's a child that earns the income, that they have no access to clean water, that they don't get beans over the course of a week, that they never eat fruit. They take that back and they sort through that information and that's how they figure out to whom they'll try to give work, meaningful work, making big heavy blankets that will then be distributed to the neediest for free, free of charge. And which children will be bought into a street kids school that they've been able to get up and running. And this, I believe, is the way forward. This is the answer for all of us to seek the most effective ways to share our resources radically, to insist that we want to know the conditions of the people on our planet who are cowering under the brunt of the weapons that we sell, that we want the media to cover this, that we want the senators and the Congress to hold hearings. And it's not so outlandish. Just recently, a Republican senator from Indiana held a hearing entitled The Four Famines, and he inquired of each of three very major United Nations figures who is bombing the infrastructure in Yemen today. And he kind of guided those people from acknowledge, into acknowledging that the airstrikes were being committed by Saudi Arabia. And where are they getting the weapons? The United States sold Saudis tens of billions of dollars of weapons in 2015, and of course, President Trump promised them uh, $100 million more worth of weapons. But there is also a bill going before an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act by a Congressman Davidson, which would prevent the U.S. from being able to engage in the jet fueling. You know, they, those jets that the Saudis have go on bombing raids, drop their bombs. They have bombed civilian targets, including mosques, schools, sewage and sanitation plants, destroyed four Doctors Without Borders hospitals. They've destroyed transportation, including public buses. They've destroyed roadways. They've made it impossible to deliver the kinds of supplies needed to cope with 400,000 cases of cholera. When the planes then circle back over Saudi airspace, the United States jets are up in the air and they refuel mid-air and the United States enables those planes to go back and then bomb more targets. Iona Craig, a very reliable journalist who is reporting from Yemen, says that the war would end tomorrow if the United States stopped refueling the Saudi jets. So we have as Phyllis has said, so many good reasons to link up with other movements that are accomplishing great leadership in our world today. But I believe that one of the most important things we have to say is that we cannot, there is no way that we can accomplish all of the good that's in the Black Lives Matter agenda, that's in the environmental agenda, that's in the Dakota Access Pipeline agenda. We can't do it and still satiate the hideous and shameful greed of the United States military. 
The resources are there, but the United States military controls and sucks up like a demonic suction cup those resources. So I believe we have to stay strong in decrying that. And also to acknowledge that, sure, there are dictators in other parts of the world. There are um, people leading other countries that do things we don't like. But our leaders aren't so red hot either. <laughs> and so we have to stop the process of demonizing other people, demonizing other governments, and building up that fear, such as what Phyllis described in Islamophobia. And then I think we can join Jane Addams in that time of shame that she felt because the United States went into World War I at all, because the soldiers were mangled and maimed and depended on drugs to survive. And we can hear Howard Zinn when he said there's no flag large enough to cover the shame of killing innocent people. And in whatever way each of us individually can, as often as we possibly can, withdraw our consent. Find ways, find ways to withdraw our consent and to say we will not personally go along with being addicted to war. So I, I want to again thank the voices um, for singing the songs that tell us, you know, inch by inch, row by row, going to make that garden grow. Thank you.